Our guest here is uh, Delegate John Hardy, Vice Chair of Finance in the House of Delegates and also a candidate for County Commission now. John, good morning to hey, you. Good morning. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, Rob reminded me I was in here uh, picking at John a little bit on the break, and he said, you know you're going to be an evil character in his next uh, book, maybe named by full name and maybe even my full address. <laughs> so there's no confusion. Yeah. And phone all. number. Yeah, 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 the whole thing. Yeah. Right. Maybe I'll come have a knock at your door maybe <laughs> one night at 10 or 11 o'clock. It's so. not that far. No, nah, we're, yeah. we're neighbors. Yeah, yeah. We live right around the corner yeah. from each other. So. Oh, would you like some cake? No, thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Joe it looks, looks, wife. It looks beautiful, yeah. but uh, I'm good. So trying to watch the calories here, you know. Chassis watch them wear. I watch them. <laughs> watch them <laughs> yeah. yeah. go yeah. down. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, hey, I want to take a minute and, and, and thank you, Rob, and thank uh, Mitch Carmichael for coming on yesterday. I gave Mitch a call last night mm -hmm. and thanked him for coming on and giving a great explanation of the Forum Energy legislation. And, uh, you know, I worked that piece of legislation in the House, and it, it looks to me that, uh, um, you know, I'm not running for the House. I am running for the, the, the County Commission. But, you know, I've been known to say exactly how I feel and what I mean. And so, uh, you know, it looks to me that the far right Republicans are trying to use that as a wedge issue. And, uh, you know, I just don't see it. I worked that piece of legislation. I understood that legislation backwards and forwards, uh, understood how well the state is collateralized in that. And, uh, you know, I would I would urge candidates who are trying to use it as a wedge issue uh, for their next election to really tread lightly. Because if, uh, uh, you know, I hear some people coming on here talking about things that are completely untrue, uh, most likely they haven't. The, the, the MOA is a public document. You are more than welcome to go and download it and read it and understand it. And uh, some of the things that I've seen, and heard uh, people that are spewing uh, that are running for uh, office, and I'm not going to call anybody out by name, but uh, I would be really careful trying to use that as a wedge issue because that's a really good piece of legislation. And I would say if you are not interested in economic development and moving West Virginia forward, you are a small thinker. You know, we are in a complete different direction in the West Virginia legislature. We are about moving West Virginia forward. We are tired of being on the slippery slope economy of, of fossil fuels. Um, listen, coal and natural gas and timber will always be a part of West Virginia's uh, economy, a large part of our economy. But we are forward thinking and we are trying to bring more industry, uh, more work to West Virginia. And... Uh, trying to diversify our economy. So I would say if you are thinking that West Virginia legislature bringing money and giving money to a company that we are completely collateralized in, uh, we own the building, we own the land, they must produce the jobs uh, for an industry that is can harness industry, uh, har harness energy that is produced by any, these batteries produce no energy. They store energy. They store energy that is produced from coal, that is produced from natural gas, that is produced from wind, solar, nuclear, hydro. These batteries are going to be built, and they might as well be built in West Virginia. So that's my spew on that. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Doesn't uh, doesn't China? Aren't they? Uh Aren't they going all in on producing these types of batteries? I'm not sure, but I know that West Virginia is all in. I know that we're these these this building is being built. These batteries are going to be built. These batteries may be used in West Virginia, but we know that there's uh, plenty of other uh, public uh, utilities that are interested in using this technology to store energy. Uh, we know that there's markets in uh, in Missouri. There's markets in the West that is going to use this technology. So uh, I you know I I would just urge people to really read and understand the legislation before you hear the negative talking points. Um, you know, I really feel this is the Rockwell 2.0 uh, in, the, in the other direction. So, but uh, educate yourself and understand that this is just one more piece of a puzzle of economic development in West Virginia. And as a Eastern Panhandle legislator, I want to see all parts of West Virginia succeed. We are doing wonderful here in the Eastern Panhandle. We've got lots of new businesses, lots of new jobs, and, and we have problems that come with that, infrastructure, water, sewer, uh, roads, all those things. Those are problems that other parts of the state would love to have. But uh, I think that uh, the West Virginia legislature has made a concerted effort, a concerted effort, to try to bring economic development to all parts of the state. And we are really trying to, listen, we're catching up. But you have to understand every state around us is moving forward. So if we gain one, they gain one, we're back to zero. So we are working diligently to try to move West Virginia forward into a new uh, economy that is not completely, completely based on fossil fuels. So what is going on? It seems to me the Republicans kind of won in West Virginia. You don't get a lot 
better win than where we where we sit right now. But there seems to be this new effort to to wrestle defeat from the jaws of victory. We've got the new Freedom Caucus. We've got the you talk about wedge issues that are going on. What's happening? Well, I mean, I think it's like any other party. When there becomes a supermajority of a party, you're going to argue with someone. Uh, you take a hundred like-minded or a hundred type A personalities and put them in a room and, you know, uh, we all think we're the smartest person in the room and there's going to be arguments. There's going to be disagreements. I'm, I'm sure the same thing happened with the Democrat party, with the pro-business, the pro-union, you know, there's, there's always going to be factions. And, and I'm not saying that you know, everything they stand for is wrong or everything that I stand for is right. Uh, we we do, do need to make sure that we do a good job of not chewing ourselves up. I will tell you in the last legislative session, I don't think I had one argument or, or, or a discussion of dispute with a Democrat. I argued with other Republicans. Um, I think they were afraid to speak up, John. Well, I, I'm not sure. But, it's a dwindling but, breed there. Yeah, but but uh, it's it's interesting to see. And, I mean, I love the legislature. I will tell you I don't like everybody that's there, but I certainly respect <laughs> everybody that's there. I mean, public service is hard. I mean, I respect anybody who is willing to sign up and run for public service because, you know, public service is just one of those things. What, what they say no one likes a, a lawyer, a police officer, or a politician until they need one. Um, so it's not a it's not an easy job, but you know we all sign up for it, and and the, the process is phenomenal. Um, I would tell anyone that you know that has any interest in being in public service or being in leg- in, in a legislative um, body to please do it. It's an awesome experience. I mean, you just I have learned so much at the legislature, and like I said, I respect everyone that's down there. I don't agree with all of them, but the process is awesome. Uh, it's slow, it's brutal, but it's designed to be that way, and that's understandable. Uh, you know, the cogs of government move slow for a reason, and I think that's a good thing. But uh, yeah, it's it's been an interesting process to see how you know when I, when I first went to the legislature, we were only fifty seven strong, and uh, we couldn't do you know we couldn't suspend rules. There was lots of things that we couldn't do. So I've seen the the flavor of the legislature change quite a bit in the five years that I've been there. So it'll be interesting. I think there'll be even a bigger wedge driven this my, which will be my last legislative session when I go down in twenty four. Uh, Delegate Hardy, so it seems that there might be a faction of Republicans that are against all economic development whatsoever. I would think that there are, I won't say that they're against all economic development, but I would say that they're against any public funding of economic development. And understand, I'm not a big fan of state government or federal government giving money to private industry either, but if that's the way the game is played, then you must play the game that way. If Ohio is playing that game, if Pennsylvania is playing that game, Virginia, Maryland, any of these other states that are looking to have these economic opportunities come to their, come to their state, and they are giving uh, resources, uh, you know, they're providing infrastructure, those are things they that have, have flat land. They, they have, have, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you're looking at Wheeling up there, which is a phenomenal industrial facility that that you know that once housed the the steel mills, and who is economically depressed. And this is a, I mean, you talk to the people that's in that northern panhandle about this project. I mean, they are through the roof. They are through the roof, excited about this, except for one delegate that 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 didn't like it, which is which was hard for me to believe. But that's his, you know, that's his prerogative. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, why, why would we not want to try to help the economics in that area? And if we bring in people from Pennsylvania, it, let's say some of the workforce does come in from Pennsylvania and Ohio. That's fine. There's plenty of workforce that leaves West Virginia every day. And when they come to West Virginia to work, they're going to buy their lunch. They're going to get their gas. They're going to spend money in West Virginia. And they may say, well, I love West Virginia. Maybe we'll just move to West Virginia. We have a declining taxes. Our personal property taxes are declining. I mean, we are on a trajectory and and heading the right direction. And um, so that's just my piece that I wanted to say. And I wanted to thank you guys for giving Mitch the uh, uh, the the uh, chance to come on and talk. I thought he did a wonderful job. And uh, and and that's my piece on on that piece of legislation. But I just would urge the public to really make sure that you educate yourself on this and understand um, before you listen to the negative talking points. John Hardy, our guest here on the program. So uh, in regards to how much money out of pocket this is for West Virginia, John, this is part of the subject of concern that people like uh, Tom Willis brought up on when he was on the show yesterday, and he's challenging our next guest, Craig, uh, for the state Senate seat. What was the total 
out of pocket expenditure for the state on the properties? It was three hundred million, but a lot of that. So, so some of it's for the building, which the state owns the building. You know, and Mitch and Mitch went into great detail, and Mitch can talk about this, you know, far better than I can. Mm -hmm. But you know. was money for the building. West Virginia owned the building for the first six years until they hit the marks. A lot of it was for infrastructure, road, water, sewer. So, you know, let's say that Form Energy comes in and they, they operate for three to four years and they completely fail. Just fall on their face. Produce nothing, right? West Virginia still owns the building. West Virginia still owns all the infrastructure, the land, everything. We're completely collateralized in in the in the project so but let's we don't want that to happen we want them to serve we want them to open we want them to do good things we want them to hire 700 local jobs that the salaries are in the 60 70 thousand dollar range i mean hell we just did the same thing down here for commercial metals commercial metals is opening in berkeley county that's going to be a phenomenal place for people that live in west virginia and some may live in maryland they may live in virginia but it's going to be good paying jobs in west virginia that will build a tax base so we've done the same thing with Clorox. Now we didn't give as much towards the building, but there's going to be pilot programs. You have to be involved in the economic development of your area. So I want to go back to the the building and the arrangement with form on the building. And I think if they hit certain marks after I think Mitch said six or seven years uh, of paying uh, lease payments on the building and such, the property then would revert to their ownership? It does, but they have to hit the marks. There's right. a certain amount of time. But they are, they're paying market value lease rates on the I building. Got, I got that, but, but why does the property have to then transfer an ownership to them? Why can't the state continue to own the property and get lease rates on because it? Because that was part of the agreement. Well, well then they have was, to pay taxes on it. Right, right, exactly, I mean, and they're 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 producing a tax base in the area, and that was part of the agreement. That was the agreement that the economic development um, secretary in his office made, and it was uh, it was a part of the piece of the puzzle to bring that business to West Virginia. So, at the end of those six or seven years, they've hit their marks. They've been paying a lease rate. At that point, are you confident the state will have recouped the three hundred plus million dollars that you the state taxpayers had put out for that property? I'm not an economic uh, I can't do the numbers, um, but there's going to be a huge economic impact to the area. Mm-hmm. So, yes, do I think the state will recoup its money? Of course I do. Now, do I think that they will recoup all of it in six years? I don't know that. I don't know those numbers. But I would tell you that it is going to be a huge economic impact to that area. When you bring in 700 and plus jobs that are you know, sixty to seventy thousand dollars a year. That is a huge impact to that area. There'll probably and, be and, some ancillary businesses. Oh, they'll, that will they'll, obviously we've seen that. We've seen that here with Procter and Gamble ancillary business. You know, we're going to see that with with the uh, the steel mill that we did that down in Mason County. There's three or four other businesses that are coming down there to support that. You know, listen, we w- the West Virginia of old is gone. It's done. We are moving this state forward. And there are people that do not want to move the state forward. There are people that are just happy with the status quo. And there are certain people in certain parts of the state that would live off of some social program for the rest of their lives and would move their children forward to move off of social programs. And I'm telling you, the West Virginia legislature has made a sta- standard and a statement that we are going to work to move the state forward. We are going to bring economic development to the state. Okay. I want to play devil's advocate here and, and, and just throw some some darts at the um, form energy kind of from the the other side which parenthetically I don't agree with but if we have uh, an eight an eight <laughs> an eight hundred thousand is my corn bee in the background yelling hardy for president by the way <laughs> we have an eight hundred thousand square foot facility that if they leave they're going to own it well of course we're going to own it because we built it so I mean there's no there's nothing special about that and there is no lack of empty, abandoned industrial facilities in, in West Virginia. So the, I, I think the concern is, you know, for the Eeyores of the world and looking at the, at the glass, glass being half empty all the time, the risk is that if they fail, then we're stuck with a very expensive bit of real estate that doesn't have anybody to put into it. I think that that I think you're absolutely wrong, John. I think you're absolutely wrong because I think with a brand new building, brand new infrastructure on a very large site, a very very large site that has lots of opportunity for growth and for other businesses, it would be no problems for the economic development people to find someone that would want that building, two somebody's, three somebody's to want that building. I mean, I'm not sure if you've ever been up there and seen that site, but I mean that is a an industrial. Um, 
site that is that's really easy access in and out of. I mean, you, you figure the the large steel mill that was there for years. I do not believe that it would be any problem to find someone for that building, especially you have a brand new building with all the new infrastructure, all the new accesses, the roads, the water, the sewer to support it. Um, I, I don't believe that that would be a problem at all. But let's let's say let's. Let's let's look at the positive side. We want this company to serve, we want this company sure. to do good. We want them to grow, and we want them to hire lots of West Virginians and produce a, a, a good product, and and be able to help uh, uh, build the tax base in the area. I'll I'll bring up an issue. You know, I'm kind of really getting down in in uh, the research and stuff with since being appointed to the first foundation. But you know, this is. This is helps combat the substance use disorder as well. When you have people, you, nobody, it's hard to raise a family on one income anymore. And if you have to drive an hour to Ohio, Virginia, or Maryland to have a job and you're stuck in traffic, you're, that's taking time away from your family. It's taking time away from raising your children, and the Internet's raising your children while you're, while you're gone. So that's creating a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the schools and a lot of the bad decisions that, our youth are making to turn towards drugs to fill that gap. It goes back to the saying that a good job fixes a lot of problems. You know, my grandfather, were, you know, I, I spent a, a phenomenal amount of time with my grandparents, and we all know that the devil works in idle hands. So a good job and having some money in your pocket fully fixes a lot of problems. So and not having I didn't, a and I didn't come one today to completely just talk about form, but you know it just c- kind of got in my crawl a little bit. I, I understood that legislation. Uh, I, I really. You know, I, I did that legislation on the House floor, made sure that I understood it because I was not going to dive in and support a piece of legislation that I did not feel that the taxpayers weren't protected in. And I understand there are people that don't want to, they don't like the public private, you know, uh, working together, but that's just the way things work. I mean, it's even moving into our park systems. Our parks are like that. We, you know, the state owns the parks, but they're, some of the facilities are privately owned and it works well. I mean, those, those things have worked and it's just another way to help move the West Virginia economy. Uh, forward. So, but I also want to spend some time talking about what I've got coming up in my next legislative session. So, um, the, the, the projects that I'm going to work on. So, uh, the first one I want to touch on, as I've, I've talked, uh, uh, here, uh, before, um, is the, uh, public funding for SROs. So, uh, I saw that, uh, Delegate Hornby walked in, and this is going to be a very concerted effort between House Finance, House Education, and House Judiciary. Uh, we're building a coalition. We're building a, a team uh, that's going to work on this. We've got the chair of education and the vice chair of education. Uh, I'm the vice chair of finance, uh, Delegate Hornby. Uh, we also have some people that are involved from the Judiciary Committee that are going to be w- working on this, and we're forming a work group. And we are really going to go in and try to work to uh, try to find a, a, a fiscally responsible way to make funding for school resource officers a part of the per-pupil funding formula. So basically we can go in and say our per-pupil funding formula is, I believe it's around $13,000 per student, all in. How much of that per student would an SRO cost? How would we change that formula? So I'm not exactly sure what the cost of that's going to be to the legislature. It will not be a one-time ask. It will be base building. It will be in the education budget. Uh, but, you know, we're certainly not expecting a, uh, an SRO for every school, but we certainly are expecting enough to have considerable numbers to, to cover. It probably would be based on some type of uh, population, uh, schools, uh, the distance from schools, um, but I tell you, I'm I'm very um, dialed in that this must be a part of working with the sheriff's department. I'm not I'm not really big on making this a second another arm of the education, the board of education, board of education hiring their own security. I believe that our sheriff is elected to be the protector for our county, uh, and I believe that this should work somehow through the Board of Education with our local sheriff's office. There will be local buy-in if you are in a municipality or you're in a county, the counties. So everyone's going to have a little bit of buy-in. Counties will be in, municipalities will be in, the school board will be in, and the state will be in. So um, I'm hoping that uh, this piece of legislation can be put together and and be able to run in the next uh, legislative session in 2024. But there's, uh, you know, still a good bit of work to be done on it. So uh, that's that's one of the main pieces of legislation that I want to work on. Uh, I think the reason Rob called me and had me on the other day was about some uh, legislation that I had for the courts. Yes. 
And? Okay, so I, I didn't want to just keep no, talking. I'll so. give you another minute. Craig hasn't called in yet, so you're good. Okay, yeah. So on the courts, uh, I'm looking for a one-time funding formula to go into uh, the courthouse fund. So looking for a way to get some money to counties that are growing their court systems. We know that uh, the courts, uh, some have picked up new circuits. Jefferson County's got a new circuit. Uh, Berkeley County, our magistrates are growing. Uh, so the counties, and I don't want it just for growth counties. I, I want this for counties that are growing their courts courts. Um, so instead of having a piece of legislation that is just for growth counties, we're going to use the courthouse fund, try to do a one-time funding into that fund, and then the counties will be able to go to them for matching grants. So if Berkeley County needs $15 million, they may say, listen, we've got 10. Can you do a two-for-one? We've got 10. You give us five. You know, it's local buy-in, but maybe a one-time funding of 30 or 40 Fifty million dollars, uh, depending on what I can get people to agree on. So that's, very good. That's, Anything else you want to close with, John? Well, there's there's one thing that uh, that I'm looking at. I'm working on some reforms for health departments. The, some of our health departments have gotten really kind of overreaching and and uh, pretty broad on some of their uh, determinations of some of the uh, the codes. So we're going to look on trying to reform some of those and really just try to take some of the gray areas out of that. So I have a meeting next week with a couple of different health departments and working. On trying to, to tighten up those uh, those gray areas where some of those sanitarians are taking some liberties and try to tighten that up a little bit. John, thanks for coming in. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Delegate John Hardy on the program here. This segment.